Welcome, everyone. I'm, we are really excited that you're here, and we want to help you today to learn how easy it actually is to import data into Neo4j. Despite all the bubbles and arrows, getting data in is actually pretty, pretty simple and also pretty fast, and that's what we want to do today. I'm Michael. I'm head of developer relations at Neo. Been with the company for a while and tend to help people. Cool. Uh, and I'm Mark. So I'm an engineer at Neo, and I guess between us, Michael and I have seen uh, seen people trying to do a lot of stuff importing data into Neo. So we're going to try to condense a few of the things we've seen into this uh, into this talk. Uh, okay. So, this is, so the data set we're going to use uh, is Stack Overflow. So first of all, who has never heard of Stack Overflow? Ah, oh, this is good. Good start. Uh, okay, so test for Stack Overflow, if you, if you have a Neo4j question, is to get your question on there and see whether Michael can answer it within a minute. <laughs> so I, I encourage you to give that a try. Um, so we've, so we've got, we're going to have a look at the, the, the Stack Overflow set from two different angles, so you can kind of see two different ways of getting data in. Uh, so we're going to have a look. They've got, they've got an API, so they kind of give you uh, a, like a programmatic API. You can grab the data uh, using a programming language, and then they've got this thing called the Stack Exchange Data Dump where there's just like a massive load of XML files, and, uh, and that gives you like the whole history of uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, and there's two different approaches to get to tackle those two different types of data. Uh, so we'll start with the with the API. So I'm gonna. So this is this is what you get if you if you call the the, the Stack Exchange API. So I'll have a look at it. I'll, I'll, do, it, I'll do it a bit bigger so we can uh, we can see it. So is that big enough at the back? Can you see the? Well, all right, great. So. So you can kind of see what we've got. So this is what you get uh, if you call their API. Um, so you get, uh, you kind of get a JSON sort of a array type structure. So you've got items, uh, and then they've got arrays of, uh, of answers down here. Uh, and you've kind of got a load, a load of other metadata with it. Uh, so if you keep scrolling down, you see you've got an owner, and they have a user ID. You can see if they're registered. Uh, they've got comments. Um, and then you've got the question eventually. And then you can tag stuff. So there's uh, there's a few different things in here where you're like, oh, okay, there's some quite interesting, maybe potentially interesting uh, insights we can get from, uh, from putting data like this into a graph. Uh, so that's, that's where we're going to start. So that's our, that's our raw data right at the beginning. Um, so what were you... What, oh, I'm, on, I'm on the wrong thing, aren't I? Sure. Hang on, I've lost the full screen. I'm going to back it. just pull it bigger and switch to see that. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so Right, so we've got JSON, so, we, so we're kind of on the left-hand side. Um, uh, and one of the things you'll notice if you read through the Neo4j docs is that it's really, really easy, uh, and there's a really uh, simple-to-use tool uh, that allows you to load uh, CSV data in. Uh, so it's intended for, uh, for taking data from relational databases into Neo, uh, but, we, but we can convert our data into that format uh, and save ourselves uh, a lot of work if we don't want to go into a programming language, for example, and we're just uh, happy to work from the, the command line, perhaps doing some data science-type work. Um, uh, so one thing you need to need to remember when you're doing uh, importing data into Neo um, is that you probably want to be doing the, mo the model and the import are kind of going side by side, and it helps to have uh, an initial model uh, to start from. Um, we're not going to go into really, really uh, real depth uh, on modeling, so there's a talk at 2.40 in here um, if you, if you want to uh, learn more about that particular aspect. But uh, all you need to know for this is that we've uh, come up with a model, uh, and I guess this will look a little bit similar to some of the graphs Emma will have shown you, uh, but this is using the Stack, uh, stack Overflow data. Um, so everything kind of starts around a question. So you have a question over here, and we've got some metadata on there saying what was the title, um, whether it's got votes, uh, what, what was the, the date that that question was created, and then that has relationships to the user, so a user can ask a question, so that would be the opening thing you did. So when you post your question, that means you've asked it. Uh, if you then go back and edit it, we, we'd add in an edited relationship, uh, and then we've got the same kind of thing for the answer. So the answer answers a question, uh, and again, you've got a user interacting with that answer, uh, and then the question can be tagged, and tags can have uh, synonyms where there's, where there's two tags, which mean the same thing. Um, so we've got a get from this diagram on this side with our, uh, with our JSON, uh, which represents the same uh, structure that we're going to try and, uh, and get to on this side. Uh, so how are we going to do it? Uh, so there's quite a nice tool, uh, which you, you might have come across, called JQ, uh, which is a command line tool, uh, and it allows you to take uh, JSON and, and put it into CSV format. Uh, it's I, found, I found it at least, I've, I mean, I haven't used it for very long. I've probably used it for half an hour in total, and I've, I found it reasonably uh, easy to get the hang of. Uh, so what we want to do first is we've got, well, we know we've from, our, from our previous slide that we've got the questions. Um, and so we've, got, we've, we've, we've downloaded the, the Stack Overflow data into a JSON file, which is exactly the same as what you saw for, uh, in the browser. Uh, and what we want to do now is actually 
get ourselves uh, to the point where, where we can just have one row uh, in the CSV file representing a question. Um, so this is the syntax to do it. So because it's an array, we're sort of saying, okay, I want to start from an array, and then I want to dig in. You remember there was an items uh, tag on the JSON, and so we're just saying, okay, go down into items and extract question ID, title, up count, down count, creation date, uh, and so on, kind of all the way down. Um, we could probably, uh, we could even run that, but, uh, if, but this, is, this is enough for, for what we want you to be able to see. So this is what you get out at the end. So uh, we've also written in a header, uh, so you need, to, you need to provide a header so that it knows what does each column actually stand for. Uh, you could choose not to if you're really good at like working with, with numbers. You could say, oh, actually, I just want column five uh, and column seven, but Michael and I are a bit better at English, so, so we go for, for naming stuff. So, uh, so we've got the, the, just the header along the top, and then you can kind of see each thing matches up. That's the question ID, that's the title, uh, and it kind of follows on uh, along. So we do that for the questions. Uh, we can do a similar, a similar sort of process for the answers. It's just the tags just change slightly. Uh, literally, all you're doing is just putting CSS selectors in here uh, to, to, to get it to drill down into the JSON and, and pull out the appropriate element. Uh, and again, you get a similar sort of CSV file at the end. So you've got, this time we've got the question and the answer, so we know which ones are related to each other. Uh, and then we've got a whole load of other metadata that's associated with the, uh, with the answer. Okay, so now, we're, now we've got to the point. So we've got, we had JSON, uh, we had a model, uh, and now we've got CSV, so we're cool. So we're like, okay, so now we need to get, we need to drive towards, uh, towards that model that we created. Uh, okay, so we're gonna, uh, we'll have a, how many people have written a line of cipher? Okay, it's more than I expected. All right, so this is good. So, okay, this is for the rest of you. We'll, we, won't, we won't spend too long yet on it. Um, so, uh, as you know from Emil Talks, the cipher is a, a graph query language. Uh, it's declarative, declarative uh, and it's sort of like a SQL for graphs, I guess would be a nice way uh, of describing it. Uh, so we're going to do a quick, uh, quick run through of this for, for those of you who, uh, who haven't ha yet had the joy of writing, uh, writing some cipher. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll start off with, the, with for, for this um, session, the most interesting uh, place to start, I guess, is with the create keyword. Um, so here's an, so I mean, it literally does as you, as you would imagine. So you're just saying, hey, I want to create, uh, and then you say, okay, what do you, what do you actually want to create? And you tell it a pattern uh, that you're looking to create in the graph. Um, and we can probably, you can probably reasonably easily read this. So we're saying, okay, well, I want, uh, uh, I want a node. So this is a node. So we've got a node here. So those, the circles are kind of representing a circle. So we're saying, okay, I've got a circle. Uh, and inside my circle, there's a, there's a user, uh, and it's got a property uh, with Michael. Uh, and we do the same for the questions, the answers, uh, and so on, all the way down. So this is, the, this is, your, uh, this is your glossary uh, for, this, for this talk, so you understand what we're talking about. Uh, these are the words that you need to know. So you've got a user. Uh, so the user is a node. Uh, so those are kind of like the records. Uh, I guess if you're used to SQL, sort of the records in your table, it's equivalent, uh, similar to that. Uh, then we've got the labels. Um, so those are ways of grouping the nodes and saying, hey, if you want to look up, look up a particular one or say, hey, in my query, in this part of the query, there should be a user, or in this part of the query, there should be an answer. Um, reasonably similar to a SQL table, apart from the fact that you can, um, I mean, there's several other caveats apart from that, but you can have multiple labels, for example, uh, on a node, uh, or you could not have one at all. But Let's say it's reasonably similar. Uh, and then the properties are kind of uh, similar to the fields. Um, so they're, they're adding for, for metadata or, or other, other inf interesting things that you want to add on. Uh, and then the last bit of, uh, last uh, glossary bit of information is here. So here, this is a relationship um, name. So we've got, what's all we're saying is I want to link that user that we had up here. So create uh, from that user to the answer, which we've got here. Uh, I want to create a provided relationship. Uh, and if you were to take uh, the slides after this talk and copy paste that in, uh, you've now created your first uh, graph using Cypher. Uh, so it's not too hard. Uh, okay, so once we've got that, so the next, uh, the next keyword that we're going to look at is the, uh, is the match. So this is the one that you're going to be using more often if you're actually querying data. So if you've got a database and you've already managed to get, you've followed this session and you're like, cool, I've got all my data in and now I'm into the next one. Um, after this where we're looking at querying, yeah, this, is, this is probably where you're going to be living. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying, uh, so match is, is, is effectively just saying, hey, can you go and find me this uh, in the database? Uh, and then we're describing a pattern. Uh, and in this case, it's, um, so actually the way to read this is actually to look at, to kind of go down to your where and go, okay, so we're, we're looking for Michael. Uh, so Michael's the user. Uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna get, get to Michael, find any answers he's provided uh, to questions. So this was just my attempt to show that Michael answers all the Neo4j questions. Um, so if you ran that query, then you'd, uh, you probably would find that out as well. Uh, so that's, that's the match, so keep, keep that one in mind. 
Okay, now if you combine those two together, uh, then you get the merge. So we're going to be using this one, this one quite a lot. This is this is one of my favourite ones. Uh, and what this does uh, is allow is uh, it either if if the pattern's there, it's not going to do anything. If it finds it, it's just uh, happy. It'll just return it to you. And if it's not there, it will create it. So it's like similar to the upsert in uh, SQL. So in this case, uh, we're just saying, hey, if Mark's uh, not there, create him. If this particular question is not there, create it. If it is, uh, don't do anything. Just return it to me. Uh, and then we're kind of just playing through the rest, as you can see. Uh, okay, so those, those are our three, three uh, main operators that we're going to look at. Uh, and now for loading data, so this is the tool that, uh, that, uh, that, we re that I referenced right at the beginning. Uh, so it's called, uh, I suppose, oddly enough, load CSV, uh, given that we're taking a CSV and loading it. So this is the, key this is the, the keyword as well. Uh, and this is, the, this is the structure of it. So we're saying I want to load a CSV. Uh, and then uh, if you want, if there are headers, so if you've gone for the, the, uh, the English approach and put your header in, uh, you need to tell it that it's there, so go with headers. Uh, and then you can say, wh where are you loading it from? Is it, is it a file? Is it uh, HTTP URI, for example? Um, and then after that, uh, you just need to say, okay, what do you want to refer to each row as? So it basically iterates through each row. Uh, so we're calling it a row. You can call it anything you want if you want a different name. Uh, and then for each row, you can apply uh, those patterns like with the uh, commands that we looked at before. Um, so that's yeah, that's uh, that's your uh, that's your preamble uh, to understand what we're going to do next. Uh, okay, so if we're if we're if we're picking up uh, load CSV, uh, this is probably the opening way that uh, that everybody starts with. So they're like, cool, I've got my CSV file uh, that we just created. I am going to create everything all in one go. Uh, often working with a file which is like 10 million lines long, uh, and so imagine what's actually going on. So saying, hey, load CSV with headers from, and here would be a path, I, sh I just shortened it to get it on the slide, uh, and then we're saying, okay, I want to merge uh, the question, uh, so I'm going to say I want to create a question node uh, with a question label on it, uh, and I want to set this metadata, so ID, title, upvote, um, creation date, so that's the first bit. Uh, then I'm going to create the owner, so whoever the owner is for that particular uh, question, so similar sort of thing, so that's another column in the, in the CSV file, so we're going to go get me the uh, user ID, get me the, d the display name. Uh, and then we're going to get, get, grab who uh, will create the relationship between the two, so who to, to say, hey, they answered the question. Uh, and then we get a little bit trickier down here. Uh, so down here we're going, uh, I want to grab the, uh, the tags. So that, that, if you remember, I probably don't remember from the previous slide, we had like a uh, semicolon separated um, field with all the tags in. Uh, so this is, we're, we're just going to grab that. We're going to split those on the semicolon so that we can get them uh, one by one. Uh, and then for each one, so I mean, this is quite similar to a for each construct in any language. Uh, we're just iterating over them and saying, hey, can you make sure there's a tag with that name? Uh, and we'll link the question to it. So that's the naive way of doing it. Uh, and that works fine. If you've got a really small data set, that's really good. Um, but it, as, as your data set gets bigger, you probably want to want to adjust that a bit. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so um, there are some tips that you uh, actually want to do when working with data. So first of all is, of course, sampling. So you don't want to uh, pour your 10 million lines of, of CSV immediately as first attempt onto the database. Just you, you, first of all, you want to try it out. So um, you can add a, um, a limit uh, up front. So you can just say, OK, I get the data from the CSV, but I'm only interested in the first 100 rows. So that's really nice for, for checking. You can also just take, take this data and return it to you so you actually see what, how a cipher sees your CSV. And you can figure out if something is wrong with the headers or something, something, something else. And then the, the uh, same applies um, as before, that um, the questions are created, the use is created, and uh, the connections are made. Um, there are some things to, to speed it up. So this is not the most performant way of doing that. So one tip is uh, actually you want to merge on, on an ID. Um, so actually, I wonder if we, no, we skipped over that, I think. Um, so what you actually want to do is um, you want to have a unique key because that makes merge much faster. And then you create a uh, constraint or index on this ID. And so Neo4j can really quickly find this, uh, this existing ent entity in the graph. Otherwise, it has to compare all the attributes with whatever's in the graph because it will check uh, with whatever you give it, uh, if it's there or not. And if you, if you know that this is my unique identifier, then it's good enough to just compare with that. So that uh, speeds it up quite a lot. And then you can conditionally uh, update this um, uh, either created or found thing. And here we only update it when we create something new. So whenever we 
have a graph where all the questions have already been imported, then each of these merge operations will actually just return them and they will never write any data. So that's really nice if you have like existing data and you want to continuously update it. Um, uh, if you're lucky and all your data is already in the database, there will, no, no single, will, will be no single write operation in the whole, in the whole statement. Uh, the same for users, and then you again merge the, um, the questions. So for this, this to work really well, you would create a, um, an index or constraint on the, on the property. Uh, so indexes are just kind of fast ways to look up data. They work on all single property lookups, but also on range scans and textual searches. And constraints additionally have the, um, the property that they uh, make sure that the entities are unique that are constrained with this property, so it's like a primary key in other databases as well. And this has two advantages. First of all, when you just create data, it will fail if you create duplicates. But if you use merge, um, it will actually speed up merge and it will uh, be a uh, guarantee that even if you run this merge concurrently, that only one element is created uh, when you have a constraint on it. So that's uh, really nice. And in our case, we create two constraints on question and user. So on the IDs, as, as we mentioned, and to speed up uh, search on the textual title of the question, we create another index, uh, something like that. Um, there's something else that you can do, um, which is reduce the complexity of each statement, uh, which can make your uh, input much faster as well, because Cypher then has to do less, and you can even run these uh, loads concurrently, uh, side by side. Uh, and so here we kind of just create questions and not all the other stuff. So if we uh, separate it out, then of course we want to have the users in its own statement and um, also the, uh, uh, creating the connections. And here when we create the connections, we m match for the IDs first of user and question and then um, just connect them. Something that you can actually do when you do this kind of one per statement, you could even say uh, with distinct row dot uh, only user ID and then it even has to look at less data than initially. So if you have like a 20 million line CSV but you have only like 100,000 distinct entities in there, then the with distinct makes it so that Cypher or Neo4j only has to look at 100,000 entities to import and not do, does the same stuff for 20 million elements uh, time and again. Uh, so that's uh, the distinct here, for instance, for the tag. So we can um, split the tags, and here we only do it uh, for each distinct tag. Uh, yeah, so that, that works really well for this particular uh, part of the, the import, because the t there's only so many tags. Like if you have a million questions, there's only going to be like, let's say, 20,000 tags. So yeah. doing merge a million times versus doing it 20,000 times save can, can be Quite exactly. a good time saver. So when there's a kind of disparity between the total data volume and the actual number of distinct items, then this makes a lot of sense. So another thing is when you have these large data sets, uh, and as near is a transactional database with transaction guarantees, so isolation, so you don't see changes of other uh, concurrent operations, uh, near has kind of to overlay the, the database state with your current transaction state. And when you import like millions and millions of entities in one go, then it uses quite a lot of memory for kind of maintaining this transaction state. And uh, what you can do here is to use, um, using periodic commit, to kind of periodically commit whatever transaction state accumulated after 10,000 rows, 100,000 rows. Um, if you have a little bit of RAM, you can even do like a million updates per transaction, uh, but then um, beyond that, so you wouldn't do like uh, two or five million updates per transaction because it gets really large. Um, so yeah, it flushes uh, the stuff to disk, yeah. It's uh, 10K, I think, by default. Uh, or 1,000, I'm not really sure, but it's configurable. You can just say, using periodic commit, 100,000, and then it uses 100,000. Okay, and this is probably a bit hard to read, but what you can uh, actually yeah, do. Yeah, we, we can go and have a look at uh, that. We can go to the editor, actually, and I'm not sure if it's better, easier uh, to read there. Um, but what you, what, you, what you would do is yeah, just put all these statements into one single file. It's like an input script like you have in SQL as well. Can you see that? Is that all right? And so we have our create constraints. We have our load um, CSV for the questions, for the users, uh, for the answers, I think. And um, yeah, yeah, we scroll down then we the connect the users and the answers. Uh, and then we also do the same for text and connect this stuff with text. So that's kind of building up our model. So we have our model, and for each of these statements, creates a certain part of the model, either nodes or relationships. And then we can actually use um, Neo4j's shell. 
Oh, they're all on. Oh, they're done. Oh, oh yeah. right. Back to that. There we go. Um, then we can use uh, oh, oops, sorry. Come. Neo4j shell, which is a command line tool, which, which comes with Neo4j. And uh, it's in the bin directory. And you just call Neo4j uh, shell dash file and then your file name. And if you have a Neo4j server running, it will connect to the Neo4j server and import it into the running server. If you don't have a server running or want to import it something in a separate directory, then you can also provide a separate directory with the minus pass um, command line parameter. And then you run it, and then it reports, I created that many nodes, that many relationships, and, and so on. And um, we didn't want to yes. run this demo. Did, did, did yeah, we can, have a, we can have a look. Yeah, let, let's have a look at the, uh, at the demo. Yeah, so we'll have a, look, uh, uh, a quick look. So I'm going to start up. Uh, I'll start up the database, I think. I'm slightly behind. You can see I'm still in 2.2 land. Emil's already told you 2.3 is where to go. Disaster. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if we start up, uh, so let's see, we've got, so we've got a Neo4j on here. Uh, right, so cool. So we've got, any, yeah, so we've got empty, empty database sitting here. I'll make that a bit bigger so you can see it at the back. Um, so typically, I guess the process would be, while you were building this up, uh, would be that you'd actually be kind of one by one, like playing around in this browser, uh, and maybe you, um, maybe we start, uh, we do this query, and we're like, okay, well, let's follow, let's follow the tip, so we'll stick in. Uh, so there's 100, 100 nodes, and then once you've got that, um, we, would, we would kind of go here and go, right. okay, let's have a look. All right, cool, we've got some questions. It's a pretty sad graph at the moment, though. You, there's nothing connected. Yeah, really it's just sad some, nodes. Just some, just some questions. Uh, so we might do that. We might load in a few and go, okay, well, that, that looks all right, I guess. There's, that seems okay. Let's start, start there. We'll put in some, let's put in some of the other bits as well. So uh, let's get a user. A question. Uh, yeah, let's get the user for the question and let's uh, connect them together. Uh, okay, so we've got right. So now we've got. So if we go there, we we'll get the users, uh, and we should be able to. Yeah, so we can kind of see if they've answered any questions. Oh, can't screen. Uh, and this is sort of like your exploring uh, tool for having a look. Well, is, is, does this model actually seem to make sense? Can I can I then go and write uh, write the query that I want to find out the answer? So you typically. You're kind of moving between importing, modeling, and answering a question that, you, uh, that you, you're really in interested in knowing the answer to. Um, so in this case, maybe we, uh, we want to find out uh, what people answer questions of a specific tag. So once we've got that in, we might go, OK, am I able to answer that with this model? Uh, and that, that's the reason that, we, that, that the suggestion is start with a smaller data set, work out whether or not you can actually answer questions, and once you're happy with the model, uh, import the whole thing. Um, so if we can actually, what we can actually do is we can go, and, uh, as Michael said, we can run this whole thing. Uh, so, so there I was just going in the file, copy paste one, two. That gets a bit boring after a while, so that's why you, uh, that's why you might build up this file, uh, and then we can point it at our uh, our import. So you notice at the beginning, it's actually some of them are going to do nothing. So you see this one doesn't do anything. Um, because the reason that it does nothing is because we so gone. Yeah. It's because we've already run it. We ran it uh, before. So the first 100 uh, is not going to do anything. So if, if the first 100 were everything, uh, then we're not going to see any, uh, any statements created. But what you get back from this is it kind of gives you like a list of uh, all, everything that happened. So you can see, hey, I created 7,000 relationships, uh, and the last ones didn't do anything. And then if we go back to our, uh, back to our browser again, uh, then we can have a quick look. Uh, let's see, maybe we can... So we could do something really simple, just say, okay, find me the user who, who asked the most questions, say. So there we go. So we could have a look at that. So Alexanoid uh, asked, the, asked the most questions. Uh, and if we, we could then go and we could might, might go, okay, let's go and look up uh, Alexanoid. So I'm going to go, okay, cool, user ID is that. Uh, and then we might say, oh, let's just get, just get that user. Or did that? Oh, that might be actually a string. That's actually, that leads us to another good point. So unless you tell load CSV what the type of your data is, it's always a string. Uh, there, are, there are functions that you can say, hey, make this an integer, make this a double. Yeah. Uh, but by default, it's a string. So, yeah. so there uh, are things like toint or 
to, f to float and so on. So if we, I mean, now it's starting to get a bit crazy. We've got too many things on here, but you can, Lexanoid, stay still. Uh, so if you hover, you can see that we've got tags. So there's a few for spring data. Uh, we've got some cipher ones up there. I think I've got this way too zoomed in. It's going crazy. But you, I mean, you get the idea. So the idea is, like, was I able, let's say my, my, my question was, can I find the user who has the, asked the most questions uh, and tell me which tags they are? You can see that this model allows us to, uh, to ask, answer that question. Yeah, and because it can become a bit tedious to write all this code by yourself, um, Will, a colleague of ours, wrote actually a web tool which allows you to take CSV files, upload them, and then um, they, you would like, if you input it into Excel, you can say, okay, these are my, co my, my columns that I want to use. This is a primary key. This is an index column. And then you create uh, the labels for your nodes. And then one by one, you have all the nodes. And then um, it actually, uh, in the end, gener generates load CSV statements for you uh, for download or to import directly into your server, uh, which is really neat. So um, if you want to do import with load CSV, I recommend to you to check it out. It also does data type conversions here and so on. So. Okay. Cool. All right, let's go back here again. Okay, so to quickly wrap up that section, so this is, so uh, we like to think of it as a sort of like an ETL power tool, so you can take, uh, you can take those CSV files, you can, you can, you can create graphs. Uh, if you want, you can actually just go and explore your CSV files, so instead of doing any actual Neo4j uh, queries on it, you could just go return uh, and do the count operations like I was doing just on the CSV file to sort of have a look at what is actually in there. Uh, so if you don't want to, if you don't want to go command line and use grep and, uh, and less or whatever, it, whatever it tools you use, you could use it for that. Uh, and it's been in Neo4j for quite a while now. So it's been there probably about 18 months. Um, and depending on your level of patience, this is good for up to 10 million rows. It depends how patient you are. Uh, obviously every, um, sort of every row that you execute a load of statements on, that's all going through a transaction, like that is a transaction, and then the next one uh, is, is the next transaction and so on. So, uh, so for medium-sized data, it, it works, uh, works pretty well. Uh, as, you get, uh, as the data set gets bigger and off of the initial data sets, uh, you probably want to do something else. Um, so what we're going to do, so now we're going to talk about, well, how do I, let's say I've got this, uh, I decided I want to use an EFJ, I've got this big initial data set, uh, lots of uh, rows and uh, lots of columns in it, and I want to get that in. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, to, to kick it off, um, uh, we're going to actually, we're going to have it run, uh, and we'll see. Um, so I'll show you the script. Um, you don't need to understand what this does uh, at the beginning. It's on the slide as well. It's on the slide as well, right? Show the slide. On the next one. Yeah. No, it's on the next so this one. is the script that we're going to run. Um, so you can kind of see... Uh, you, we're going to go through this, but effectively we're just saying, hey, here's a load of files. Can you create me a database for them? And this uh, creates the database in a different way, so it kind of just creates you a completely new database from scratch, and you say, where do you want it to go? Uh, okay, so what we're going to do uh, is we're going to kick it off. Uh, and so we're underway, and now we're going to go back and see how, whether Michael can finish talking before it's done. I'm probably not fast enough, but let's see. All right. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the code that Mark just showed, and this is what we want to create. So we have Neo4j import into a database. Our IDs are strings, and here are our CSV files that we want to have. And we say, okay, we want to create posts, users, tags, and these relationships, parent of, answers, has tag, posted, and so on. So how do we go about it? Um, first of all, we have to tell uh, the input tool what the mapping is. So kind of say, okay, this is a node with these properties, these properties have these types, and this is actually the, the idea of this property, so, uh, of this node. So for instance, for the, for the post, for the question, we say, okay, you have a post ID, colon ID, and it's a post. Um, we could leave off the uh, post in parentheses uh, if you have like UUID, which are unique across all our different entities, but in, oftentimes, if you come from a relational database, your primary keys are just auto-incremented, so we would, we would get actually collisions in different tables. So that's why we, you can specify this. The same for users. Uh, you can, behind all the properties, you can say, okay, this is a string, this is an int, this column should be ignored. Um, that's actually also pretty uh, useful. This column is an array, which is automatically split into an array property and so on. And then for relationships, we just say our start ID uh, comes from uh, the user space and the end ID comes from the post. 
which would be done in the CSV, and then we can arbit have arbitrary properties and relationships as well. So that's kind of our the kind of description language uh, in the headers uh, of these files. And what we actually want to do um, is, um, so this is what, this is what the, the, uh, the data dump of Stack, uh, Stack Exchange looks like. So you basically get like a three gigabyte file uh, of XML. So if you like XML, it's pretty good times. Uh, but if it, like us, we, we don't really want XML, uh, then we've got to figure out a way to get from this like gigantic uh, statement. And you can kind of, if you kind of, if you read it, you can see it's pretty similar to that JSON API we looked at before. So we've, they've checked the, some of the, the, the casing of, the, of the, the properties is slightly different, but the content is pretty much the same. Um, yeah, so, so it seems to be just a dump of the uh, SQL server that they run SQLflow on. And it's really like, if you uncompress it, it's like 66 gigabytes of data with all the comments and posts yeah. and tags and, and badges and users and, and so on. So again, we've got, we've got like a, a, a data transformation problem that we've, uh, that we've got to get. So before we had JSON and we wanted to get to a certain t to a type of CSV. Uh, now we've got XML uh, we want to get to a, a slightly different type of CSV. Um, so we actually, uh, so Michael actually wrote a program uh, that would kind of concurrently go through, through these files and, and create the CSVs. Uh, it's probably too complicated for us to actually be able to go through that line by line in here. Uh, and pro uh, so, we're, so we're just going to say, hey, there's a magic Java program in the middle. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a Java program, any language you want. Uh, you just need to get the files into the format that the, that the tool is, uh, is waiting for. Yeah, you can use Python or Ruby or uh, JavaScript or whatever to generate the CSV after all, right? And so what, what we generate uh, as part of that is uh, the headers. So we could just say these are our headers for the posts. Post ID, title, post type is int, what I mentioned before, created at date, uh, all the kind of numeric fields, and uh, then the actual data that we get somehow. somehow it's, uh, it's kind of two rows of that. Uh, so we actually also zip it on the fly again, the, the CSV, so it doesn't get that large. And the uh, Neo4j importer can uh, work with uh, zip files as well. So, and these are two rows of the data, the first two rows. And there are uh, 10 million more rows in, in the data set, I think. And um, for relationships, uh, we create the uh, uh, relationship between um, the um, so these are between answers, the answers, and the answers, uh, yeah. answers and questions. And so this is my start ID is opposed, end ID is opposed. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can, if you want to, provide relationship types and labels within the CSV, uh, but oftentimes you get the CSV from somewhere else, which is oftentimes also hard to edit. If you have like five gigabytes of CSV and then you open it in, in Notepad or so, then it will probably blow up before you, you see it. And so we can have the ability to specify node labels and relationship types on the command line outside of the CSV file. And uh, then we just run it with that, right? So what we showed in the beginning, uh, we have the import tool into the database, ID type string, and then we list all the CSV files. Uh, we can even have multiple CSV files. So if you got something from someone that's split in 100 files or so, you just put like a comma separated list of files in there and then um, it takes all of them in. And this is a highly concurrent tool, so it uses all your CPUs, all your IO bandwidth, and um, it's really able to ingest all this data in a, in a really short time. So we put here in like three minutes, 10 seconds. Let's see how long uh, it took. Let's see how long it really took. All right, uh, so, so if we go from the top, so kind of just my, what Michael was just describing to you. So we start off, we've got that script. Uh, we're kind of going through, so saying I'm gonna create you nodes from these files. So you see we've got a header, and we've got an, uh, an associated data, again, header data all the way down. Uh, and it's telling us what label it's actually gonna create. So I'm gonna make everything in these files are gonna be posts, everything in here is gonna be users, everything in here is gonna be tags. And then I'm going to create you a parent off and answers a has tag and a posted. Uh, and then it kind of does a quick check how much memory you've got in your machine. And you get uh, an update of the stuff as it's doing it. Uh, so you're you see here that it writes 78 megabytes per second, which is not too much. So it can go up to like half a gig uh, per second if you have a fast enough disk and enough CPUs to kind of create the data. So apparently the laptop is not quite as performant when all of you are watching it. Uh, so it's taken an extra 28 seconds. But what have we, we've created 31 million nodes, 78 million relationships. Is that 218 million properties? Uh, and it took the amount of time it took Michael to explain the tool. Yeah. So it's not bad. And it's the whole of Stack Overflow. So you have all questions, all users, all answers of Stack Overflow imported into Neo4j in three minutes. Uh, and then the, the line you can see on the end uh, is telling you, hey, you told me that there should be a relation, uh, there should be prob is usually there was there, you told me there was a relationship between no two nodes in one of your relationship files. I couldn't find one of them, so I'm just going to log that for you and carry on rather than uh, rather than blowing up. 
So there you go. So you can get quite, you can get the whole of Stack Overflow into Neo in under four minutes, uh, and quicker than uh, than either of us can explain it to you. Uh, so quickly, some tips to wrap up. Uh, so the, the number one thing that people people run into when using this tool is uh, is having their CSV data that they're working with is uh, is really unclean in various different ways. We've kind of listed some of the ones that we've seen. So uh, having Unix um, line breaks mixed in with Windows line breaks. It's like, uh, okay, which one which one do you want me to use? Uh, so we, a consistent style will make your life much easier. Uh, you need to make sure your headers line up with the data. So if you put in a header which has a completely different number of fields to the number of fields that are in your in your data set, as again, it's like, okay, what do, what do I do? Um, so you need to you need to be you need to be a little bit kind with it. Again, if you've got special characters in there, make sure you quote them. Uh, have a look at the stray quotes. So it, uh, obviously, being a CSV, it kind of uses quotes to separate a field. So if you do quotes and then you have a random quote in the middle, it's like, okay, cool, the field ended here, and actually, no, it was meant to end over here. So you, I mean, it's just sort of CSV, sort of normal CSV hygiene. Uh, and then any non-text characters, you want to take those out, uh, those out as well. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, um, if you have a fast disk, or even a faster disk, that helps a lot. So on my uh, server, I run it on an SSD array to kind of be able to ingest all the data volume. Uh, it also helps to have separate disks for reading the CSV and writing the Neo4j database, because then you don't overload the I.O. channel as well. You can compress your CSV files, which actually makes a difference, because it has to less, uh, load less data from, from disk. Uh, if you have many cores, it scales really linearly across cores. So if you have like two cores, it's, it's half as fast as before, or eight, or 16, or 32 cores. And uh, something that's really neat is that you can separate actually the header file from the rest of the CSVs, because uh, if you kind of fiddle around with this header format and edit it, you don't want to do it again on a 20 gigabyte CSV file, because even VI takes a while to save 20 gigs of uh, CSV again. Yeah. Right. Also makes it really easy if you're, say you're using a dump from Hadoop, uh, so I've often been playing around with Spark to actually generate these files, and it tends to give you, spit you out a whole load of CSVs, and it's like part 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 up to part 0000032, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, and the header's nowhere to be seen, and you're like, okay, so what do I do? Do I, should I get those CSVs all in order and put a header at the top? In fact, as Michael said, it's much easier to just have your header completely separate, and then you can just feed in all the files uh, uh, yeah. onto the command tool. Another advantage of having the separate headers is also that you, uh, if you have denormalized data, so you have a single CSV, but you actually have like five different nodes and three different relationships in the same file because it's completely denormalized, it has like 100 columns or something like that, then you can just use separate headers to uh, kind of ignore all the other columns that you're not interested in and create nodes once, create nodes twice, create first set of relationships, get create second set of relationships all from the same file. So you can reuse the same denormalized file, you don't have to split it up yourself up, up front, but just provide different, different headers and the different places in the command line and then you're good to go. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, th so that's the end. So we'll, uh, we'll put these slides uh, somewhere. So if you, if you want to grab the, 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 the stuff that we talked about, this is where it sits. Um, otherwise, this is the end. We have three minutes, 34 seconds left. For questions. For questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Oh yeah. So the question was which. Yeah. So the question was which uh, means do we have to to read from pipes? Uh, so do you mean Unix pipes or command line pipes? So you can. Uh, I think for most of those you can use Unix pipes as, as sources, but you can also just pipe command line data into it. Uh, that that also works. For instance, for near for shell, I can also just pipe command line data into it. Um, for Unix pipes, I, I think there was an issue uh, a week ago, so where someone asked um, in another tool if it works, it works with pipes, uh, but these tools should actually work with pipes. Oftentimes, I think um, you might still want to create the files. Um, there are also means to kind of really point uh, a tool uh, directly to a relational database, and it completely sucks out the data out of the relational database using the schema of the database. That's also something that you can do. And um, by the general, it shouldn't be a problem to work use with pipes. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so you mentioned that the system for initial load is in certain situations in which data already exists, the standards are not updated. What, what, what are the distinctions that you can do? Yeah.
Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the distinction to use uh, the input tools for updates versus initial loads? Uh, so currently, the uh, Neo4j importer, so the, this fast tool, is made for really for initial loads. Uh, we plan to also make it possible to update databases with that. It's just we didn't get to it. And uh, so what I suggest is either uh, use this tool for the initial set, then load CSV for incremental updates, or we ha also have a, um, a previous non-concurrent batch importer API, which can also work on, on existing databases. Yeah. That's what, what you saw. The, the merchant creates that you saw in the load CSV is the same that you do in Cypher, either with, with data from a CSV, but you can also do like data that you pass in as parameters, for instance. But they already said uh, when merge will only update it uh, when you have, say, on match set. So if you kind of if you find it, you should still override it or certain attributes um, then as well. More questions? Otherwise, we're also around at the graph clinic. Yeah? Yeah, so I, I wrote a tool which actually uses the same API behind the scenes to do that. And there's, um, uh, there's uh, and you just pointed to, um, yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, let's see. I named it. Come on. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess you, can, you, can, you, can, you can show him afterwards, otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, we're going to delay the next talk. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, thanks, point, just pointed to a relation database, and it uses the meta model of the, or metadata of the relation database and uh, pulls this in. Cool. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, everyone.